So let me uh, add my welcome to, to those from Augustine. My name is Hyun Song Shin. I'm the economic advisor here at the BIS. And it's really a, a pleasure uh, for me to moderate this first panel. So as you've seen from the program, this is, a, this is quite an ambitious program. We have six panels spread over, over two days. And um, you can see that the, the topics that uh, we're addressing um, are also very, uh, you know, quite varied. And, and some of them are actually, uh, um, at first blush, somewhat far removed from big tech, uh, like, for example, the, the panel on crypto uh, later today. So you might think, well, what on earth does crypto have to do with big tech? Uh, you know, crypto operates under the banner of decentralization. Uh, you know, big tech couldn't be further away from decentralization. But you will see that there are some very important connections there. And uh, what I would like to do uh, with the benefit of this fantastic panel is to um, look ahead to the six sessions, uh, but also use it as an opportunity to retrace our steps, uh, to see uh, you know, how we got to where we are. Um, now, I have a bit of a confession, because when uh, you know, we wrote the the chapter on uh, big tech and finance, opportunities and risks. So this was the special chapter on, on big tech that we wrote in 2019. Um, our focus was very much on you know, some of these competition, data privacy issues, and the interaction between network effects and, and market dominance. Uh, and we had very much uh, you know, some of the existing policy debates in mind. Uh, but what really propelled that chapter to the center of attention was, of course, the, the Libra proposal that came up in the, in the summer of, uh, of 2019. I think uh, Christian Catalini is also um, uh, here with us, and, and, we'll, and we'll see, uh, and we'll sort of reprise some of the, some of the issues that, uh, that we covered there. And I think the, it does actually tell us, um, uh, you know, a very important element in the discussion that has galvanized uh, you know, our thinking here, which is that it's, uh, it's a combination of network effects, data, the centrality of data, and the way that that has really turbocharged this, um, uh, the platform economics. But also, uh, for the central bankers among us, it's also the, uh, the link to the monetary system, which is really, I think, focused uh, in a focused attention. Um, and uh, I think that debate that we had in 2019 uh, was really a, a, a was really a, a kind of you know a a, um, uh, a way to galvanize to uh, way to galvanize some of the sort of you know uh, very deep seated debates on on the uh, singleness of money uh, and and the integrity of the monetary system. Um, and I suspect this is the reason why this topic is such an important one. Uh, not only for competition and data privacy, but because of the, uh, of the infrastructure of the financial system itself. So I suspect that we will cover more than big tech. Uh, we may even cover crypto and uh, fintech in general uh, and the way that it links to the monetary system. Um, so uh, we have a fantastic panel. Uh, we have Gillian Ted from the Financial Times that you that you know, uh, all know. Uh, Wei Xiong, my former colleague at Princeton. Uh, Otavio Damaso from the Central Bank of Brazil. And Sir John Cunliffe from the Bank of England. Uh, they all have their, their particular insights, uh, both because of their day jobs, but also uh, because of, uh, uh, of many of the international roles that they have. So without further ado, let me uh, first turn to, to Gillian and ask Gillian to kick us off uh, with some initial remarks. We'll have a set of initial remarks, um, and then we'll circle back uh, and then gather some questions, uh, post to each other, and then I'll uh, turn to the audience later. So, Julia. Well, thank you very much indeed, and it's a huge honor to be here today, um, particularly because I think I'm the only person on the, on the panels who is not an economist or a practitioner or a central bank official. So... Thank you. And if me being a journalist, I should say I'm an editorial chair of the editorial board of the FT, if me being a journalist makes you nervous, let me stress that this meeting is off the record. And um, 
I'll also stress, I'm actually speaking partly as a cultural anthropologist and someone who's done a lot of work in the academic field looking at the anthropology of finance. So think of me as a Cambridge academic instead, if that reassures you. Um, I've got two or three quick points to make. Firstly, I was actually at a meeting of the Swiss National Bank and the IMF uh, moderating some panels in 2019, just after the Libra idea was being floated. And what struck me at the time was that for those of you who are Japanese or have spent time in Japan, Libra was the financial equivalent of a black ship sailing into Japanese waters. Those of you who know your Japanese history will know that an American warship, the famous black ship, sailed into Japanese waters and so terrified and horrified the Japanese that it prompted an astonishing explosion of innovation and restoration in their financial and economic models in subsequent years. So Libra, I think, is a bit like a black ship. It sailed into central bank waters, shocked and horrified everybody, and has subsequently sparked a welter of debate, which I hope will be productive. Um, but uh, when I say hope will be productive, because as Augustine has laid out with tremendous amount of both clarity and force, and his comments are very provocative, the challenges are considerable. Now, looking at this with my FT hat on as co-chair of the editorial board, which means I sort of you know, bring together the, convene the brains trust of the FT once a day to thought, talk about these issues, there are a lot of very obvious structural questions. Um, we at the FT have written extensively about the challenges around tech. Um, essentially, they fall into three big buckets. One is the antitrust bucket, which has caused big tech to be fined over and over again, particularly but not exclusively in Europe. And although some big tech companies, particularly those like Microsoft, show signs of trying to learn from the past and behave in a way that's not going to provoke regulators, um, that is, remains a big challenge. Second big bucket, which Augustine referred to, is the issue around data and the fact that not only are these companies sitting on vast quantities of data, they are prone to sometimes data leaks, they're also prone to data abuse, and there's a real issue around privacy issues. Um, made much more complicated about the fact that, as an anthropologist, I often say that although economists like to think that that word barter was relegated to the caveman era, um, in fact, we are currently living with the world's biggest barter trade ever seen in history, which is a wholesale swap of personal data for services. It's not barter in the sense we're haggling over the price, but it is a barter trade in, in the sense that it's not mediated by money. It's massive, it's unrecognized, it really matters, and it creates all kinds of issues. And the third bu big bucket of issues is obviously around the fact that innovation is happening much faster than 99.9% .9 of humanity understands, and unfortunately that includes regulators and FT journalists. And that is alarming. Um, it creates a huge asymmetry, not just of information, but of understanding. So those are the issues with my FT hat I would look at. But I want to briefly mention that there are a bunch of issues which as an anthropologist I'd point to as well to do with culture. Um, it's a truism of anthropology that we're all tribal beings and we like to hang out with people who are rather like us. That applies to journalists, it applies to what I call the Basel tribe of central bankers who collect at, around the BIS. And I'm often told the Basel tribe have more in common with each other than they do with their national politicians. And it's also a truism of anthropology that because we're tribal creatures, we are inevitably locked into social patterns, which mean that we engage in rituals which reaffirm our shared worldview and reproduce it. It's very hard for us to see that worldview and see it in context. A fish can't see water, as the Chinese say, unless you jump out of your fishbowl and go swim with other fish. But the assumptions we have are very powerful, although we don't recognize them. And it's another truism of anthropology that we can't see the assumptions and how tribal we are um, and how different they are from other tribes because we all tend to assume that the way that we look at the world is correct and natural and inevitable and everyone else could and should see the world the way we do. 
Now, this matters because the story of the modern world is one of endless different professional silos misunderstanding each other inside organizations and between organizations. And when I look at the Silicon Valley tribe, which I know pretty well, um, spend a lot of time there, and anthropologists have done a lot of studies of the Silicon Valley worldview, there are three aspects to it which are quite distinctive and encapsulated, by the way, by someone who is seen as, if you like, the leader in their creation mythology, which is Steve Jobs. And these three elements are, one, utter disdain and scorn for the establishment. Two, a strong belief in the value of moving fast and breaking things, to cite Mark Zuckerberg. By that I mean, you know, the Silicon Valley mentality is, it's fabulous if you have crazy bold ideas, and if you try them many times, and the first 10 fail, who cares? That's a badge of honor, keep going. And the third aspect is, Code is truth. And by that I mean that the, most people who are trained in CS assume that there is a purity in computer science engineering in solving problems, that you just keep trying over and over again to solve a problem with math or with code. You keep iterating until you get it right. Now, those are very distinctive worldviews. They permeate throughout Silicon Valley. Um, there's nothing wrong with them. I'm not making a value judgment at all. Um, but they are obviously very different from the assumptions baked into the worldview of regulators and financiers. Regulators are paid to uphold the establishment, not scorn it. They generally hate the idea of moving fast and breaking things. And for the most part, they know that although economic models or computer science is a fabulous tool, they know that it needs to be set within political and social contexts. You can't just ignore everybody else. So my big question is not simply how do you overcome the antitrust issues, data issues, and the speed of innovation? How the heck are you going to cope with the potential for cultural misunderstanding on a very profound level? I don't have many answers. I happen to think it's a reason why anthropology is a great complement to central banking. But I would just say good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gillian. That was fantastic. Uh, we're going to go in the following order. We'll, we'll go next to John Canliff, uh, and then to uh, Ottavia, uh, Ottavia Damaso, and then, and then to Wei. Um, so, John. Okay, well, uh, thanks very much, and thanks for the, uh, thanks for the uh, invitation uh, to, to speak. I've, I've been in central banking. I've been in a number of tribes, actually. But I've been in the central banking tribe for nine years now. Actually, when I started, it was all about banks, and then it was about non-banks, uh, and somewhere, um, I think we're all going to use the same example, uh, somewhere three or four years ago, it became about technology and big techs and some of the connected things about crypto. So I thought I'd say a few words, almost from a personal experience, of what this, looking backwards, what this journey uh, has, um, uh, has uh, felt like, and just a couple of examples at the end. Um, uh, so uh, big techs matter as central banks, as regulators, as financial stability authorities, and as monetary authorities. Um, an illustration of how much they matter, I'm afraid I'm going to use that uh, June uh, 2019 moment again, is actually what happened when Libra launched their proposal for a cross-border, a multi-currency, uh, stablecoin for general uh, purpose use. In the Bank of England, we'd be looking at uh, technology, at uh, crypto, at central bank digital currencies, quite a few years before that, and this has been a really interesting discussion that happened, and every now and then it surfaced to the policy level, and we looked at it and thought, well, that's some years off, but mm, some interesting questions there. Um, uh, we'd explored some of the impacts of, of, of fintechs. We decided that most technology wasn't really much use and uh, wouldn't deliver us very great benefit, uh, and Facebook's announcement, I think, was like a switch being thrown, and suddenly uh, we were, um, it wasn't a question, theoretical question, you know, of, of money and payments. Suddenly, these were very real issues that seemed to be coming at us very fast. So questions like, who's allowed to issue money? Can we start to think again, really, about practically who's allowed to issue money? Uh, how do we regulate not just the issuers, but the money, uh, the money itself? How do we maintain monetary sovereignty? Remember, we're looking at a cross-border uh, proposal. 
and actually, how do we manage something uh, which uh, might just be stateless, might just operate uh, cross-border? Because we didn't at that point know exactly how they were going to uh, locate it. And that was not just for the UK. I mean, for, for many years, the problems in cross-border finance, slow, inefficient, unreliable, dominated by vested interests that don't have much interest in change, had been known, and nobody ever really got round to doing very much about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the launch of Libra actually galvanized uh, the, uh, the political and the central bank establishment into saying, can we, can we actually improve cross-border payments? Because that seems to be the business model uh, for this thing that we find uh, a black ship, but I'll use it, um, uh, quite, quite, uh, quite worrying. Um, and uh, the G20 cross-border payment um, roadmap, the initiative that's going on with central bankers, regulators, the private sector to improve the current systems, I think actually owes its origin to, uh, uh, to the, Facebook, um, the Facebook proposal back in 2019. Um, now, of course, Facebook, and this I think goes to Julian's tribal point, completely, they said they would launch uh, their first in 2020. Um, Sterling was a bit, kind of come along a little bit later. Um, integrated, a bit le uh, integrated a little bit later. But um, I think they completely underestimated what it would take to get the permissions to launch uh, that. We had some conversations with them, and it was like talking to people uh, literally from another, another planet. And I think central banks completely overestimated how quickly uh, they could move. I mean, they, uh, it, lo it looked to us at that point that they actually could introduce something in, in two years. And the project failed. And I think one of the projects, one of the reasons the project failed was these two cultures and the dialogues just weren't ready uh, to talk to each other. Uh, but also, I think the regulators um, generally felt they didn't, um, they didn't have the knowledge uh, to know how to regulate this thing uh, at that time. But it's an example, even though it failed, of the impact that big techs can have, when, not even when they come into the world of finance, when they consider that they might come into the world of finance. Why do they have that impact? Well, I mean, Augustine set out uh, uh, a lot of this, but uh, they're very big. I mean, Meta's got 3.5 billion uh, users. Um, they have huge capability that we don't have in the, in the financial sector. So Microsoft say they have over 100,000 uh, software engineers. They're rich, uh, their profits are, are, are large. I mean, Apple, I think Apple's profits, um, they say are larger than the annual revenues uh, of Starbucks. Uh, and they have this ability to bundle data um, with other services and just blur the boundaries between different things that we'd like to keep uh, in separate pockets. But I think there's another reason why they have this impact uh, on, uh, on our world, and that's the speed uh, at which they can grow and the scale at which they can grow. So Facebook had 12 million users in 2006. Four years later, it had 600 million users. Uber had three cabs in 2010. I think they're probably all in San Francisco or somewhere. Uh, five years later, it, it was doing 1 billion rides a year. And then two years after that, it was doing 1 billion rides a quarter. And I mention Uber because um, Uber maybe, uh, uh, when we talked about this in, in the bank, uh, in the central bank circles, was an example of, of what we wanted to avoid. This idea, we called it, um, people refer to it as Uberization. Uh, this idea that, um, uh, uh, particularly when you're dealing with, with firms that want to move fast and break things, that you wake up one morning and there's a million people, or five million people, or ten million people, using something that they find quite useful, and you have just no idea how to regulate it and how it fits into the existing system. And then suddenly you're in the business as a, a regulator, not of trying to work alongside innovation, uh, to make it sustainable, but retrofitting, uh, and in some cases taking away something that people quite like, uh, and now that has very considerable uh, lobbying, uh, lobbying power. And that, that um, experience of having to retrofit regulation on things that have grown to scale, you can see that with the internet platforms, in Jillian's buckets, in competition, uh, in data. It's incredibly difficult to do once these things uh, have got uh, to scale, and they can get there uh, very fast. So um, it's, I think that was really the thing that was most at the back of our minds, that this thing w would actually 
develop, billions of people would use it, it would have benefits, but suddenly we'd be trying to retrofit uh, a regulatory framework around it to deal with risks uh, in finance and in, in money and in payments, uh, and we would find that enormously difficult to do. So I'll highlight sort of three areas, uh, three or four areas where this is important to us, and then two quick examples. First, the impact on financial stability. So, um, and there are lots of aspects to this, but, but one really important aspect um, is, uh, I, I don't think we as central bankers or regulators um, have any responsibility to protect a particular banking uh, business model. Uh, it's not our job to protect banks uh, from competition from people with very different business models uh, and uh, different technology. But the financial sector plays a very crucial part in the economy. Uh, and if it is destabilized, uh, the impacts can be, uh, can be very severe. So there's a whole set of issues about um, uh, how the existing financial sector uh, will cope uh, with the challenge uh, from new entrants that could, could grow to be very large uh, very quickly uh, in that world. And how do we manage the transition from where we are and where we want to be? We ran a, an exploratory stress test in the Bank of England in 2017, pre-Facebook, pre uh, asking the banks to say, well, have you thought about what might happen? Uh, we're thinking about fintechs, then when others come in with different business models. And actually, at that point, we thought the awareness in bank boardrooms of some of the challenges and how they would manage the transition, for example, losing their retail deposit base, was actually woefully, uh, woefully like they really weren't thinking in those terms. So there's the financial stability aspects of adapting to new players uh, and new business models uh, and ensuring that's not, uh, that's, that doesn't lead to instability. <coughs> Secondly, I mean, the mantra regulatory arbitrage, um, which we all talk about all the time. Emerson said, if you build a better mousetrap, the world will be to pass to your door. But it really does have to be a better mousetrap. You have to be offering something um, that isn't there in terms of efficiency, <coughs> functionality. It can't just be... Uh, that it appears to be a better mousetrap because it operates to different rules to the other mousetraps uh, that are operating uh, in, uh, uh, in the economy. And we have a, another mantra, same risk, same regulatory outcome, which I think is a, is a really good guide to how you go, but actually, so same risk, same regulation, but actually what, what we've seen with, with the big techs and more generally with technology is that's not very easy when the technology is completely different. Uh, when things are being bundled in different ways. So I think as regulators, we have to start thinking about same risk, uh, same, uh, same regulatory outcome, even if we had to get, get to the outcome in a different way. And there, our lack of knowledge of data, of data engineers, of how these things actually work um, uh, is a real disadvantage. Third, competition. Um, the Bank of England has a secondary objective uh, in, uh, in its regulation activities around enhancing competition. Not all central banks have that. Uh, it's not our primary concern, but it is important to us uh, because digital markets have a tendency to concentration. There's a lot of research on why that is, uh, and that brings dependency, uh, resilience questions, uh, and dominance uh, into play. Um, and um, the last thing I'd mention on... Uh, uh, on this side, is just the cross-border nature of this uh, is difficult. It's taken us many, many years to work out cross-border governance of, uh, of um, global banks uh, and to instead wholesale capital markets. And now we're dealing with a different set of players uh, that operate to different regulatory rules. And just the, the, uh, the international community finds it very difficult to get its arms around that. You only have to look at just how much road mapping scoping, overviewing the Financial Stability Board and others are doing. This is a group of people trying desperately to get their arms around this thing and think, well, how do we, how do we work together to set standards, which, as Augustine said, is, is <coughs> crucial, but it, it, isn't, it isn't easy. The last challenge, though, I think is going to be the most difficult for us, which is how do we get the benefits? Because there are benefits. I mean, anyone checking their smartphone at the moment because they're bored with what I'm saying, is, is, a, is a demonstration. There are lots of benefits, uh, and the big techs have brought benefits. They've changed the, the way we live. And um, how do we ensure that we start from a position that's technology blind and business model blind when we're faced with something 
that looks threatening, and that's maybe a challenge to our tribe uh, and, the, uh, and uh, the way we see things. I think it is enormously difficult. Um, uh, I'll echo what Gillian <coughs> said there. The best I can offer here is how we do that, is we, we need to engage early. We need to talk. And, and there is some evidence that the two tribes are starting to understand each other better, if only by the number of ex-central bank and regulatory sort of people who are being employed by some of the big techs, which has got a positive as well as a negative uh, aspect to it. I think we have to set up what we care about. We have to be very clear about the risks we care about and the risks we're trying to protect. Uh, we have to draw up broad regulatory frameworks. They won't be right, but we have to say, look, this is a, uh, where we see the framework of regulation. Here are some examples. Here are some, for instances, knowing that it'll have to be flexible and we'll have to change it because you have to at least give innovation the possibility of knowing what it has to innovate, what framework it has to innovate uh, uh, within. And um, we, uh, we should be flexible about how the risks we care about are managed and completely inflexible about the level to which they're managed. It's the level of resilience that matters, not the kind of how you get there. Although, as I say, uh, that's not, not easy. And just two very quick examples. One is cloud. Um, where we're seeing financial firms putting more and more of their critical business uh, on the cloud. Big benefits, greater resilience, a way for, certainly in the UK, financial firms to deal with legacy systems that have been very difficult, uh, very difficult to modernise, efficiency, new functionality. But then the obvious concentration, three firms provide 80% of the cloud services uh, in the UK. Question of how to regulate. Um, they're not financial firms. They provide services to the economy as a whole. I have to read Augustine's speech carefully, but I'm, I'm not sure it's possible just from the finance end to do group, uh, group supervision. In the UK, we've decided on a partial model uh, now before Parliament where, we will, uh, where they provide services to the financial sector. They're required to be registered. We'll designate them. They'll have to participate in stress tests. We'll be able to set some standards um, and require information but we won't actually supervise them per se. I think Europe's gone a bit further in that we want them located in Europe and we want to be able to supervise them per se. Somebody would explain to me what the US is doing uh, in this area uh, at some point. But I think these are regular... I mean, it's not, uh, there is a regulation of bank service providers, but it's not to me sure how, uh, how this will be done. And the other is in payments, which is where I started all this. Uh, we issued our, um, uh, our consultation document on, on the Bank of England issuing a digital currency. Uh, we put that out yesterday. Uh, it's, it's a great read. I mean, I'd recommend it if you've got nothing to do for several hours. <laughs> um, but one of the motivations we gave for um, uh, the Bank of England introducing a digital pound uh, is the concern that uh, if, if these new forms of money are developed by big players and we get concentration, we'll get walled gardens, fragmentation, and actually it'll stifle innovation and competition because in order to use a platform's money, uh, Libra or whatever, to use the example that didn't happen, or DM, to use the example that didn't happen, you'll have to operate within their system. It won't be interoperable uh, with others because we can see the tendency in these platforms to operate in that way all, all the time. Whereas if we can offer an open platform and a public digital settlement asset, uh, digitally native that anyone can use, then developers, private sector developers who don't want to issue money but do want to have new payment services and functionalities can actually use that. So we actually, it's counterintuitive to some people that um, uh, issuing an open public alternative could be a benefit to competition rather than a threat, but actually uh, we and the Treasury and the government saw it that way. I'll stop there, thanks. Thank you very much, John. Uh, I think that's a perfect uh, transition to Otavio, um, given the experience in Brazil. Um, okay. Otavio. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Shin, John, Jillian, and Wei. Uh, I would like to start my congratulating uh, by con con congratulate BIS for organizing this event and thanking them for inviting the Central Bank of Brazil uh, to participate in this panel. It is a privilege to be here with such distinguished speakers. The world of finance is constantly evolving, 
And one of the most important points of attention re in recent re years has been the entry of big tech companies in the field. This has been of concern not only for the financial industry, but also for financial regulators, financial supervisors, and other policymakers. While there are many positive aspects in the entry of big techs into the finance, there are also challenges and risks that need to be careful, evaluate to find a balance that allow maximize benefits for society in short, in the short, medium, and the long terms, while minimize negative effects. In terms of benefits, big tech tax have favor innovation, financial inclusion, making it, e it easier for families and companies to access non-financial products and services with simple and practical financial solutions, whether in payments or credit granting. They have also been successful in using the power of network economy in data gateway from proprietary socio social networks. The broad capillarity of big techs in their distribution channels for products and services can also favor a broad acceleration in the achievement of financial inclusion targets in several jurisdictions. Some of these services are offered free of charge to clients, which has been an effective lure for consumers, especially individuals. However, as financial regulators and supervisors, we also need to consider a broad range of issues, such as market structure, data and consumer protection, AML policies and practices, and potential risks to financial stability. Our main goal is to set a regulatory framework that guarantees a competitive environment and prevents potential risks to financial stability. I would like to highlight these last two points, competition and financial stability. On the issue of competition for financial regulators, it is a crucial that the regulatory framework supports an environment where entry barriers are as low as possible for new entrants, as is also important that this allows an adequate level play field for all market participants. In that regard, there are several aspects and challenges to be dealt with, such as, first, how can we mitigate some of big tech's competitive advantages, such as access to data and network effects? In a specific case, a well-designed open finance, open data framework could balance the scenario, allowing data flow to and from big techs. Rules of uh, open and fair access to their platform may be required, allowing the sharing of data with new entrants and offering data portability to consumers or other interest parties. Second, how can we prevent the development of harmful vertical structures where big techs can concentrate gratuities in some service, charging in other services that it is more difficult for new players to enter the market? This could probably be avoided with the improvement of national laws, the regulations, setting limits for big tech to unfair enjoy their market power, uh, improve in, in pricing users in their products and service, and avoid any kind of exclusivity clauses in their contracts. These issues uh, can be even more important in the specific case in which big techs are both IT providers and potential competitors. Uh, let's turn to the financial stability issue, where there are also some challenges. Big tech can pose relevant risks to finance, financial system, both as an eventual big financial service provider or as a mere IT provider, not direct carrying out financial and payment services activities. At this moment, the most critical risks posed to financial stability are as IT providers. They play the role of third-party provider for financial institutions of crucial, critical services, such as processing and storing data, cloud and computing, and artificial intelligence. This scenario is aggravated 
when several financial institutions use the same big tech as their IT provider. It is a classical case of concentration risk. As financial supervisor, we often don't have the legal mandate to directly regulate or supervise such big, big techs as IT providers. So this presents us a big challenge. We try to suppress those limitations by imposing direct requirements through regulated financial institutions, but is uh, far from being the best framework. As financial or payment institutions, big techs are not yet relevant in Brazil, and consequ consequently, they don't pose any material risk to financial stability. However, I don't have any doubt that they have the potential and eagerness to become relevant financial or payment providers posing direct risks to finance stability. To finalize my initial remarks, I would like to briefly talk about the recent Brazilian experience with big tech companies in financial services. It is important to highlight the similarity in how big companies sought to enter two important segments of the Brazilian financial system, the fast payments and the open finance. In both cases, two features of this movement stood out. Building up, first, building up a partnership with a single large incumbent player, at least in the beginning. And second, offering financial services indirectly without entering the regulatory permit or requiring the most basic kind of licenses, also in the beginning. The main concern of the Central Bank of Brazil in both cases was the potential consequence for the competitive environment. In this context, in a nutshell, the remedy applied by the regulator and supervisor has been to demand that equal conditions be applied to all market participants, avoiding any kind of, a, of exclusivity clause. The requirement let, be, let big techs come to, to consider redesign the original business models. So being done with my initial remarks, uh, let me tell you that we will be a pleasure to answer any Q&A questions. Absolutely, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely come back to some of these issues. Um, let's turn to Wei uh, for his initial remarks, and then uh, we can pursue uh, one or two of these themes that have come up. Wei. Thanks, Yung. Uh, it's a, a great pleasure to be here. In fact, it has been a great pleasure to join the discussion at the BIS over the years. Um, uh, this is actually a, a great time for uh, uh, academia at uh, Princeton. Uh, the rise of uh, big tech and the fintech uh, uh, is, uh, uh, as Julian uh, uh, mentioned, uh, uh, a black ship to not just to, <laughs> to the central bank, but also to academia. So this is a brand new potential for a very different financial uh, model. Uh, it's fascinating. Um, uh, talking about different tribes, I actually had uh, a pleasure also to join discussion uh, with another tribe. Uh, 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 Jack Ma created a, a, a think tank for digital economy a few years back uh, called the Lohan Academy. I had the pleasure to join the academic uh, committee there and, uh, and be involved in a lot of discussion about uh, uh, this uh, uh, black ship in China, <laughs> actually, uh, uh, by offering a wide range of financial services there. Uh, uh, N Group also had uh, stimulated a lot of uh, uh, fascinating uh, uh, development uh, with the rapid rise of uh, uh, big tech lending uh, uh, there. Um, I had, uh, uh, with help uh, from uh, Lohan Academy, actually, uh, I've been engaged in a, a research project analyzing uh, uh, some of the lending by end group and compare the lending of end group with uh, uh, a traditional bank, a traditional uh, commercial bank in China. So I thought I would use uh, this, uh, my opening remark to say a few things about what uh, I see uh, in, uh, from that research project. Uh, of course, uh, 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 many of you know uh, uh, that uh, uh, big tech lending uh, uh, had experienced a very rapid uh, uh, increase uh, in China, and uh, uh, N Group is uh, uh, spearhead of uh, uh, this new development. Um, 
From this uh, data set uh, I have been looking at, basically it's a 10% uh, a random sample uh, for lending by N group with uh, uh, this commercial bank. Uh, um, uh, this uh, 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 is a syndication uh, lending program. Uh, it's a very large actually data set, even though uh, the sample period has been short because this uh, uh, new model has been only been operation for three years. But, but uh, even though for a random ten percent random sample, you already covered uh, half a million loans. So, so it's uh, you know it, it really offered a, a quite uh, a nice picture of uh, uh, the lending how it operates. Uh, first, uh, I, I want to mention uh, five uh, uh, patterns I saw in this data. Uh, first, indeed, uh, a lot of financial inclusion, uh, a lot of lending uh, uh, was to uh, 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 borrowers uh, with uh, uh, limited, uh, if any, access to uh, traditional bank credit. Uh, uh, in fact, actually, half of the borrowers uh, in this uh, sample actually uh, uh, had their first uh, business loan. Uh, uncollateralized the business loan uh, from this lending program. So in that sense, sort of this uh, is a sort of entry for them to get uh, 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 uncollateralized bank lending or uh, credit, uh, credit services. Um, and secondly, um, risk uh, is not uh, high, despite uh, lending to uh, this uh, group of uh, 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 usually we regard as sort of uh, uh, uncertain uh, 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 borrowers, right? And in fact, actually, risk has been a key concern. As you know, uh, N Group's uh, IPO a couple of years ago uh, was suspended largely because of concern about uh, potential risk uh, in uh, these services, right? So that's why I, I, I was quite, uh, 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 as a first question when I, I, I got the data, uh, was want to uh, figure out how much risk uh, actually is in this uh, 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 sample of uh, uh, lending app sample of loans uh, uh, to, to this uh, uh, set of borrowers. Um, by compare uh, uh, the two set of uh, uh, loans, right? So big tech uh, uh, loans uh, from N Group and, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, traditional loans uh, from this uh, 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 commercial bank. Um, roughly, it's, uh, risk is a little bit higher by the loans from big tech uh, and group. But, but it's important actually to look at the borrowers. Half of the loan, roughly half of the loan are to what I mentioned, uh, first time borrower, uh, uh, first time getting uh, this uh, uncollateralized business loan. Uh, among the first time borrower, risk is indeed higher, actually about uh, uh, double the level, okay? But immediately after the first loan, as long as any borrower had uh, uh, paid off at least one loan before, then risk is almost the same compared to uh, uh, the the, the uh, traditional bank borrowers basically there's no difference, right? So in that sense, actually, uh, uh, the picture is quite uh, encouraging just from this risk point of view, right? So you know, of course, uh, you know, offering the first loan to any borrower, <laughs> the risk is going to be higher. And in fact, this is sort of uh, uh, very good to know that uh, actually uh, this is happening. But uh, but this uh, this immediately after first loan, uh, risk came down. Um, the third uh, uh, observation I want to uh, highlight is uh, interest rate. Uh, the interest rate uh, in this set of loans, big tech loans, uh, is higher. On average, 14.6% uh, uh, annual, uh, uh, which is about 5.6% uh, higher than uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the other traditional bank uh, loan. So, uh, so in that sense, uh, this is service, of course, uh, especially sort of in terms of cover all these uh, 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 first-time borrower, right? So, so there's a cost there, interest rate cost, right? Okay? And the fourth uh, observation I want to uh, mention is uh, a fast repayment. Uh, from the sample I saw, uh, payments is very fast. On average, uh, uh, a borrower of this big tech loan program uh, repay their loans uh, uh, at about, uh, on average, 46% of the loan maturity. That means uh, for a loan of one year maturity, on average, borrowers pay back uh, uh, in five months, okay? And in fact, actually, if you look at the distribution, 
uh, 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 half of loans are actually paid off within three months. So, so in that sense, uh, this is very different from uh, the, the traditional uh, bank lending. Uh, borrowers tend to hold their loan to the end, okay? Uh, of course, this is not surprising because of the higher interest rate, right? At this interest rate, uh, uh, a borrower won't want to uh, keep their loan for too long, right? Um, but uh, the fast repayment also reflects another important aspect. That means that uh, uh, these loans are not used as, uh, 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 to finance uh, long-term uh, projects, right? They're used more as uh, working capital to cover uh, the borrower's uh, short-term liquidity need rather than their long-term financing need, right? So, so this is uh, uh, important uh, because uh, uh, this actually uh, 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 highlights something potentially important about so the business model uh, for this uh, big tech lending program. Uh, instead of covering uh, borrowers' uh, uh, long-term funding need, right? So it's more aimed at uh, uh, covering the, the short-term liquidity need, right? Uh, 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 finally, I also want to mention, actually, uh, in the, uh, uh, the loan sample, so there's also a small set of uh, borrowers actually uh, also had access uh, uh, to regular bank lending, okay? So in a sense, this is an overlap the sample. Uh, this is a set of borrowers, potentially, uh, this big tech lender need to compete uh, with uh, uh, traditional bank for, okay? Uh, you would uh, uh, expect uh, uh, this set of borrowers, which are potentially uh, have higher quality, right? To obtain better term, right? Have higher credit limit and the lower interest. Uh, but that's actually not the, uh, what I see. Uh, in fact, actually, uh, this set of overlapped borrower almost got the, uh, the same terms as the other borrowers, right? So uh, uh, also 5% uh, higher interest rate. And also they pay back their big tech loans very quickly, right? So, so this suggests actually, uh, um, uh, at this moment, uh, the, this big tech lender is not actually directly competing with traditional banks, even for the uh, marginal borrowers. So they're using the same uh, model. Uh, uh, they charge a high interest rate, uh, aim to help uh, 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 the borrowers uh, 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 with their short-term financing need. And of course, why would the, uh, this borrower want to take this loan, despite having actually cheaper uh, traditional uh, uh, credit services? Uh, this is potentially related to the convenience, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 the, the big tech platform. As earlier, uh, uh, Panas all mentioned uh, that uh, 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 network effect and the convenience all built into uh, the system. It's very uh, helpful to use it <coughs> very fast. Uh, uh, so that uh, they're willing to use it despite the higher interest costs. But nevertheless, actually, uh, despite of the, all of this, I think we observe a very nuanced picture here. Uh, uh, this big tech lending program uh, indeed helped uh, uh, with the financial inclusion by offering first loans uh, uh, to many of these uh, uh, borrowers uh, which had uh, uh, lacked access to traditional uh, uh, bank credit. Uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, this, this, uh, 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 the, the, uh, uh, we also see that uh, uh, the big tech uh, uh, lender is not actually aiming to, uh, uh, their advantages in some sense are, are specialized, right? right? Their, their coverage actually, uh, even though the data is powerful, it covers a lot, but uh, uh, their coverage seems to be specific to certain uh, need. Of course, we know uh, uh, N Group uh, leveraging on uh, its uh, a very powerful payment system, right? It knows a lot about uh, 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 um, a lot of users' short term uh, uh, cash flow, right? So, how much they're coming in and how much they're, they're, they're going out and all that. So, so uh, a lot of big uh, data technique help to predict their uh, cash flow going forward. But uh, it seems that at the moment, uh, a lot of this uh, uh, coverage. Uh, are used for, at least uh, so far in this lending program, uh, it's used to sort of help with uh, 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 short term, uh, uh, um, uh, used to focus short term risk rather than, you know, offer them the capacity to compete with the banks for uh, covering long term uh, credit services, right? So, um, yeah, so with all of this together, uh, uh, I think sort of uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this speak for uh, a greater question, sort of uh, uh, eventually the competition issue, right? 
So how will this big tech lender gonna compete with the traditional banks? So this is a fascinating uh, topic. Everyone in the panelists uh, 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 mentioned uh, uh, this issue. Uh, it seems like at this moment, uh, they're not directly competing because they, they have its own niche. Its niche is this set of borrowers. And, uh, and even for this specific set of borrowers, uh, this big tech lender is covering their short-term liquidity need, right? Right? And of course, uh, going forward, the key question is that whether these borrowers can eventually graduate from this uh, incubator, you might think of this as incubator, right? Without the actual earlier uh, credit access, now they have to this kind of uh, 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 particular uh, credit access, even though uh, our interest rate is high, right? Uh, there's some evidence uh, that uh, some of the borrowers have been able to graduate. Actually, uh, Leonardo <laughs> have been also uh, uh, doing uh, some very nice work on this. So there's some evidence uh, some of the uh, 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 borrowers are able to graduate in the sense of getting, uh, eventually getting access to uh, 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 credit from uh, uh, traditional banks. Right, so I think this would be actually a key question going forward. In what extent that uh, 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 the big tech lender can help this set of borrowers and eventually actually be integrated into the bigger uh, financial system? And also, uh, in what sense that big tech lender uh, can uh, expand uh, its uh, lending program actually to offer a, a, a full set of uh, 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 services? I think this is a question <laughs> we are yet to see. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wei. We will explore this uh, connection with the banking sector in the next session. Um, Julian, you've, you've heard the officials to my right uh, lay out, if you like, the vision from the Basel tribe. Um, and the focus has been on regulatory outcomes, uh, if not necessarily regulation as such, but it's a regulatory outcome. It's, we're thinking in terms of the optimal allocation, it's a mechanism design problem. It's a very, uh, if you like, a directed engineering type of approach. You had a column uh, some months ago that uh, looked at uh, Neil Ferguson's book on the tower and the square, where I think it's somewhat related to your uh, discussion of the Silicon Valley tribe. Uh, utter disdain for the establishment, move fast and break things. Um, and code is truth. Um, so, you know, wearing your anthropologist hat, um, why don't you share some thoughts on what you've heard from, from my right, and how does the crypto discussion fit into the, the big tech debate? And in particular, uh, some of the things that we'll hear later, um, I think stable coins are, I think, a very interesting manifestation. Mm -hmm. Where it's really sort of uh, many of these things are are are, um, are going to uh, you know converge. So Julian. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, I think my role here is to make everyone feel very nervous, because I'm basically you know look as if I'm peering at everyone around me. Um, and by the way, apologies for being husky and sound like a French jazz singer. I've had a bit of a chest infection. Um, I've got two points to make about the way that Western society is developing today which I think are very important to think about in relation to the role of central banks and regulators. The first point is to do with trust. Um, anthropologists used to say that there were two types of trust that glued societies together. You either had face-to-face -face relationship, direct relationship-based trust, which operated horizontally in small groups who kind of all knew each other and trusted each other because they were face-to-face, or when groups became big, you had essentially vertical trust where people trusted in a leader or an institution. And that was very roughly the models that you know, anthropology used. The 21st century, courtesy of our iPhones, has created a third type of trust. And I don't think people have thought enough about the implications of that, which is distributed trust. And that is huge groups of people who trust each other in a horizontal way by virtue of tech platforms. And the way that Uber works or Airbnb works is essentially you're trusting the crowd by virtue of having supposed checks and balances within the tech system, peer ratings and things like that. That's also the way that a lot of cryptocurrencies supposedly work as well. 
you have massive distributed trust. And there's a fundamental clash right now between the way that central banks assume that money works, which is they operate on a vertical trust model, and if you're in charge, if you're part of the tower, to use Neil Ferguson's brilliant metaphor, referring to medieval European cities where you had a church tower, a clock tower, from which the ruler would stand and look down on the crowd, that's a model that central banks tend to work within. And yet today, many and a growing number of functions in our society operate in a horizontal model, the so-called square. Now, Neil says that historically, power has oscillated between the square, the crowd, and the tower. Um, I think that's probably still true. But I think we need to recognize it in the world of finance. There is a fundamental clash going on. And if we don't recognize it and think about it, central banks will end up talking to themselves. The second big issue is around the relationship of self and society. 99.9% um, .9 of societies in history have viewed the individual as essentially fitting into the group. Um, you know, they were a cog in a bigger social machine. Um, then, courtesy of the Enlightenment, um, a development occurred in Western Europe initially, which culminated in the 20th century of the individual thinking that they were at the center of their world. It's almost a Copernican shift, the me generation. The 21st century has actually developed a new modification of that, again, because of the iPhone, which is extreme customization now seems normal. We use our phones to customize everything in cyberspace and by default, we think, in the real world. You know, whether it's our coffee choices, whether it's our music choices, whether it's our media choices, whether it's increasingly our political choices, and I would argue, our money choices. Generation C, generation customization, generation P, generation playlist, pick a mix if you like, takes it for granted that we all are supposed to live in our own version of the matrix and customize everything around us all the time. This matters in all kinds of subtle ways about how people imagine finance and money because again, most central banks operate in a vision that they basically hand down the fixed menu of choices and everyone else has to fit into that. They live, if you like, in a world of vinyl records, where someone gets to choose what's on the record and present it to people. And most of the public are living in a world of playlists, where they think they can pick and mix everything all the time. It even infects, I'd say, how people imagine wholesale financial markets. I mean, I was chatting to someone yesterday, earlier, about the fact that in the world of treasuries markets trading, for example, um, you used to have old-fashioned relationships which drove a lot of the trading. Um, now you have no relationships, you just have collateral-based anonymized trading, pseudonymity, if you like. Um, and that's something for which seems very odd to people of the older generation. It doesn't seem so odd to people who are younger and living in this popular consumer culture world. So one of the questions I have for the group is that as big data and digital services and tech companies come into finance, they're bringing this distributed trust model. They work in a world of extreme customization and personalization. In fact, they are driving much of that because of this barter trade between data and services. Um, and central bankers are operating in a different model. So how do you reconcile that? And what does that mean for how money's going in, in the future? Because, you know, just to pick up on Hume's point about cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin, when people talk about Bitcoin, the tribe that's you know, gravitating towards Bitcoin are doing so with a distributed trust model, supposedly. I mean, of course, we all know that's baloney because of the way that you've got these centralized brokers developing um, and the concentration of services and platforms around, you know, things like um, the um, FTX and things. But, you know, the rhetoric is one of distributed trust. The rhetoric is one of personalization. And the question of how you square that with central banks is curious. Um, maybe, uh, I think this, uh, you can turn to John to provide the answers. I'm just paid to ask questions. Well, maybe, maybe I can kick off and, uh, and, and you can complete the argument. I think, um, uh, and absolutely, absolutely. <coughs> and I'll tell you also, uh, you know, tell us about picks and the, 
and, and I, I think, Julian, you've made a brilliant uh, sort of, you know, you've, you've given us a brilliant challenge on, on exactly the, the topic that we should be really uh, you know, uh, drilling into. Can I just can I say one other quick thing while John is thinking? Um, <laughs> I'm being kind to you, John. Um, it's worth stressing, also, by the way, that norms change. People sometimes think of culture as being like Tupperware boxes. It's kind of sealed and fixed, and you can stack it on top of each other um, in a hierarchy of value. It's not like that at all. It's a river, slow-moving river that constantly changes and moves, and new streams come in. And just a one tiny example of this, which matters for financial services enormously. Um, a few years ago, Intel asked a bunch of its anthropologists to go and study the difference between Chinese and American attitudes towards facial recognition technology. And they discovered, surprise, surprise, that Chinese were already adopting facial te recognition technology to a large degree in banking services, as Wei knows. Um, and at the time, this was all of four years ago, the Intel team thought it was completely unimaginable that Americans would ever accept facial recognition technology because there were constant shrieks in the media about how evil facial recognition was. Well, fast forward to today, and guess what? A very large number of Americans are quite happy using facial rec recognition technology on their phones without a murmur of complaint. So attitudes to what is normal change rapidly. There's a lot of cross-border borrowing going on. I can see some of you looking at your phones. Um, and we can't assume that this is going to stand still. So, John, I think um, if we you know, stick to the singleness of money, uh, I, I think one of the sort of, you know, uh, and, you know, this would be my, uh, you know, my answer to Gillian, that, you know, one of the great triumphs of our monetary system as it stands uh, and tried and tested is that it's, uh, you know, whether you have a banknote or whether you have, you know, one pound in your, in your account, it is, the same, it is the same money. We don't really think twice about an exchange rate, uh, you know, between those. And, uh, you know, this has really uh, been a way to, uh, uh, to really sort of knit together the whole monetary system, the whole financial system, and the way that you laid out the digital pound, uh, I thought was a very sort of compelling case for taking that, you know, to the digital age. And I, and I guess um, uh, the example of PIX in Brazil is another shining example of how uh, the benefits can be, can be reaped, you know, in that, uh, in that regard. So um, if you sort of amplify on that and, uh, and also, you know, give us some, some additional food for thought, that would be great, John. One of these folks. Yeah, I was, was going to agree with one thing and maybe disagree with another that Julian said. And, uh, and I'm not an anthropologist, although yeah. in the end, to understand money, I think you do have to understand kind of how we conventions that we have and what we accept. The thing I would agree with very strongly is we are in a world of, of central bankers and regulators where we think that people access financial services through a thing called the financial sector. And it's clear that there's a group of people growing up now who don't access, don't think about, just don't think about those things. In that I need financial services, I go to a bank. You know, I need, I need um, butter, I go to a grocery store. They, they, everything is, is kind of bundled together and moves in a different way. So the kids buying Bitcoin on their phones in the playgrounds uh, in the UK, and there's quite a few that seem to. Yeah, I don't think, oh, I must make a financial services investment. <laughs> How do I get onto a platform? It's part of their social media and the like, and I think we are, um, that's going to be a struggle for us, just just understanding that the uh, the things that financial services provide come from different channels. On the money question, I think um, hello, we're going to face this um, uh, distributed trust issue when somebody asks us whether they can use the permissionless blockchain uh, for, um, for verifying ownership of money and the like, and are we comfortable with it? Um, but the thing I'd say about money generally, because it's um, there's so many different ways in which um, society can agree on a convention about what is accepted to settle an obligation. That's in the end what we're talking about. Um, and sometimes there's nothing behind it other than the social acceptance. Sometimes there's something behind it like, well, the state can make you pay taxes and this is the thing that they would accept, which is one of the theories about how, um, uh, how modern monetary systems grow. Um, it all works fine until the day it doesn't. And the point is, is not whether P 
people will prefer different types of money. We hand down one type of money and we say this is safe. And if you issue money in the UK, you have to show us that you can meet that standard. Um, uh, it's that people would use other things until the day that they don't work. And the thing that takes that stops the working, and I don't can be triggered by different things, is when the trust and the confidence of what's behind it, be it an institution, be it a kind of set of assets that represent some some value in society, when that confidence breaks down. And once it goes, it goes, you know, it's not, it's not, it doesn't half go. It sort of goes completely. And these are the kind of runs we see. We've seen a bit of that in the crypto world um, uh, uh, at the moment. So I think there will be other forms of money and verification mechanisms that use distributed trust rather than use kind of um, centralized intermediaries to uh, public sector or private sector to do it for that. But it's really important that the thing that is accepted as the, the settlement asset uh, in society and the way you store your settlement assets so that you can kind of cash them in today or, or hold them tomorrow actually has something behind it that people have confidence in. And I, I don't, and maybe I'm just too far up the tower to, to see it, um, but I, I don't see that changing. And we've actually seen very different forms of money with very different things behind them, kind of over, uh, over centuries. But you come back to that once, yeah, there has to be something behind it. it, it look, if the confidence in the state goes, then the confidence in the state issue settlement asset goes, and there are plenty of examples of that as well. So we're not the only way. Um, but I think conventions that turn up on the internet or in the crypto world about, well, somebody else accepted this so that I can accept this and it'll work, I think those things are quite fragile, actually. And the state has to be quite careful that they don't get to systemic scale, because if they do get to systemic scale and then fail, um, you, you can get sort of huge economic and actually societal problems. We're only on the first floor of the central banking tower, so that's some encouragement. And John, while you still have the microphone... It all happens on the 18th, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> You'll see that later. But while you have the microphone, uh, still John, um, you, you touched on a very important issue during your uh, initial remarks, which is the international cooperation. Could you expand on that a bit? And uh, 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 what would be the outlines of that uh, international cooperation? Um, so right across this... I mean, this is more than big techs. This is right across this whole field of new players, new technologies, changing, uh, changing existing ways. Um, I think we are still in the main, in the phase. There's normally, in the international community, well, but generally for the poetry of policymakers, there's a phase where everybody struggles to understand the issue um, and just develop a lexicon to talk about the issue uh, and discuss it. And then there is a kind of narrowing down phase to alternative ways of dealing with it. I think in the main, the international community is still in the first phase, partly because it doesn't understand. Some of these issues are driven by technology, very different things that we don't, uh, that we don't understand, partly because it's happening in different, different ways in different parts of the planet. Um, we're just starting, I think, to set out some of the regulatory perimeters. Um, the CPMI committee that I uh, have the privilege to chair with IOSCO, so we're the standard setters, for systemic payment systems, we actually put out guidance on how the existing standards for payment systems would apply to stablecoin uh, use systemically. Um, that's been out for consultation. That doesn't cover all of this waterfront, but it does set, um, has some international agreement about what that framework, that regulatory framework will look like. So if you want to develop a stablecoin, you have two choices. You have three choices, actually. You can go outside the standard, which um, some of the crypto world, um, you know, by, by uh, almost by religious belief, want to be outside of any standard. You can try and develop within the standard, and some people have come to talk to us about that. Or you can lobby against the standard, which most seem to be doing at the moment. Um, but but we've, that took two years. Uh, and one of the most one of the other reasons I think that. The, the inclusion, uh, exclusion models that Augustine was talking about. One of the things you have to do is say, how do I deal with this in the conventional world? How on earth do I then port across that objective, that regulatory outcome into, into this world? 
which is why I think the extension of standards to deal with this has to be anchored in what we do elsewhere, otherwise you'll get regulatory arbitrage. But that was a difficult process that took two years, and it got to one standard that covers one use uh, of some of these technologies uh, in one sector, if I can put it that way. So it is a, it is a kind of huge job. But um, uh, the, the encouraging thing, I think, is just the amount of attention that's being given to it. Otavio, um, Brazil's PIX has been a, a really shining example of exactly this kind of uh, um, the um, interoperable uh, and open system that's, uh, that's really opened up uh, financial services of huge chunks of population. Uh, two thirds of the adult population now are, are using PICs. Um, you also had, a, had some interactions with a big tech around about that time as well. And I think it, it could have gone in, in a very different way at that point. Tell us um, uh, some of your experiences surrounding that launch. Okay, excellent question. Uh, first of all, uh, we need to understand uh, how we reach the peaks. Uh, I think in 2016, 2017, uh, when we are in the process to decide to implement a fast payment in Brazil, uh, we look, look to other international experience like China, and we see a duop, duopoly, and we didn't like. We look, look to other experience here in Europe. We see some kind of uh, uh, big banks arrangement that, that has many barriers to enter new entrants in the fast payment, payment arrangements arrangement. So we decided to, to, to bring the, the basic, basic solution to the Central Bank of Brazil and give uh, the, the same condition for all participants in the market. All financial and all payments institutions can operate in the same way in the peaks. And more than that, they can develop innovations uh, based on the peaks platform. Uh, so the, the big question is uh, the big techs want to operate in fast pay, fast pay arrangement, private fast pay payment arrangement. I, I don't use, usually comment about specific cases, but I try to, to talk in general terms and you understand. Uh, we, we don't, we don't have any barrier to new interest in the fast payment scheme with, uh, together with PIXO in a different way. way you know? But in the license process, we analyze uh, multiple, multiple factors uh, regarding the business, business model that the big tech is proposing. You know? Uh, we look to competition, we look to financial inclusion, you know, to consumer, you, uh, we look to market structure. No? So in some case, we identified some uh, harmful uh, business model, and we required uh, the big tech or big bank or any, any kind of um, demand institution to adjust the, the business model to uh, avoid this specific uh, problem that we observe. In that. So uh, it is the way that we operate. We don't have any specific barrier for new entrants in, in, in any kind of uh, segment in the financial sector. Uh, we understand that we need to give the society and uh, multiple ways to do the transfer of money and the society will decide what is the best one for doing in specific time, specific, specific amount. You know? So, but of course, when we receive the business model, we try to understand the business model and identify any kind of uh, uh, any kind of uh, risk for multiple factors. Thank you, Tavio. I, I think it's really, uh, um, just to paraphrase what you've just said, it's really about laying down the rules of the game. Yeah. And uh, provided that uh, the entrants follow the rules of the game, 
then of course they are actually free to, to engage. And I think uh, that sort of level playing field. So I guess the level playing field, Gillian, is halfway between the tower and the square. Or maybe it's part of the square as well. Uh, but uh, I guess it's one way of trying to provide a kind of you know, point of reference that everyone can try and rally around. Um, if you like a neutral space. And way, um, I think what you described is a really interesting case where uh, you know you, of course, you know data and um, your you know data trail really is the essence of finance in some way. And if you have no public records or balance sheets that you can actually take to the bank. Um, Having a data trail of your activity could be a very valuable asset, even for the for the borrower, let alone for the lender. And I think what you've said really is a very good illustration of that. Um, how would you um, think about the the future sort of competitive landscape? If we can build on what you have learned, which is that uh, by making services accessible, you can actually create the data trail, which will then be used to uh, allow them to access conventional financial, um, the conventional lenders. Um, how can we ensure that level playing field that uh, Otavio has actually laid out? Right, uh, that's a, a fantastic question. I think this is a central question uh, because uh, the rise of big tech uh, is already there. <laughs> so, so then how to integrate uh, big tech companies uh, with other traditional uh, financial institutions is, the, uh, is likely the future, right? So, and uh, data is indeed uh, uh, the key element here. Um, uh, for big tech companies to tap into their existing uh, platforms, right, uh, which already covered a lot of data, about their users and uh, leveraging on their uh, existing data to offer financial services uh, can be uh, uh, very helpful uh, in terms of uh, uh, social welfare. And uh, uh, from the sample I saw, uh, there's uh, already uh, uh, a benefit, a large benefit already there, right? So for this group of uh, uh, bowlers uh, who, who lacked that before. Uh, but of course, going forward, uh, we see that at this moment, uh, uh, the data, the use of data, actually, even though it's powerful, it has a limitation, right? It's, uh, it covers specific uh, dimensions of the users, right? And by offering them uh, uh, services, financial services, uh, uh, particular credit, based on the existing data, uh, generate additional data, <laughs> right? And, uh, and, and now the question is, how to make sure uh, we don't create a new monopoly, right? Uh, uh, which actually can trap the set of borrowers in this uh, uh, current uh, uh, lending, uh, the big tech lending framework. That's, uh, that's the challenge going forward. I think uh, uh, that's why actually it would be great actually to allow uh, a credit rating uh, 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 from these uh, uh, big tech lenders because they already have uh, uh, very important and useful services there. Uh, uh, this data uh, can provide uh, additional uh, credit information and this uh, credit uh, rating they can provide can be very helpful uh, for these borrowers uh, 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 to obtain uh, 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 credit from other lenders. And, uh, and in that sense, this is a very important uh, uh, data sharing that could uh, actually be quite helpful. And how to standardize uh, this kind of uh, rating and integrate that with uh, a traditional rating system. I think that is, and also potentially actually, uh, uh, make sure, because a, a very important part is the data trans, uh, to make sure the data is portable, right? You know, of course, there's so much data in the big tech uh, 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 platform, and uh, you know, uh, forcing all the data to be uh, tra transferred out is uh, uh, infeasible and uh, probably not necessary, right? So to create sort of a few key instruments, uh, credit rating being one of them, but potentially other as well, right? Because uh, uh, thinking forward, that other kind of services can be offered as well, not just credit, right? So, so then uh, I think to, 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 to create a few, uh, I think a, a lot of uh, uh, big data techniques can be used, but, but how to standardize 
uh, uh, the the the, uh, uh, the 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 index creation uh, 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 will be the key. And of course, so sort of according to sort of uh, another uh, important uh, development, uh, uh, open bank. Uh, 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 for bank institutions, right? So, so it's uh, uh, you know which is happening simultaneously. So I think so to make sure data to be uh, 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 transferable uh, across the aisle, right? not just one dimension, mm -hmm. one direction, but actually going both directions, so that uh, 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 traditional banks and the big tech lenders uh, can share data together. So then that would be important actually for the benefit of the the best benefit of the uh, uh, the borrowers.